Is that the big red button? <laughs> All right, I think it's safe to say that this is the episode I've been looking forward to the most in this series. Welcome to episode four of Halo 2 Artifacts, where we'll be covering all of the hidden gems and unreleased features from Halo 2. I'm once again joined by Max Hoberman. Hey Andy, nice to see you again. Great to see you again too, Max. And we've come to the end, but we've got some great things to cover in our last episode, some of which have never been discussed in Halo 2 development coverage. And I think we can once again just jump right in. And I'm going to start with some of the bigger ticket items, and we can work our way down to some of the smaller... Some of the, some of the esoteric items. Yeah, some of the, the smaller, <laughs> maybe more absurd ones. <laughs> All right. Each of them will follow a pretty similar format where I'll ask you about the feature, uh, whether it was kind of ever prototyped and in-game and what ultimately led to its downfall. And in, in most cases, I'm sure this will be time, but uh, I'm excited to jump in. All right, yeah, let's do it. This feels like the uh, lightning round. Let's go. <laughs> All right, so many fans will have seen videos from the Halo modding community, but let's start with a, a short single word that would have changed Halo 2 maybe more than any other item we'll discuss in the series, and that is Sprint. Sure. Sprint is only mentioned in three of almost 300 files that I've looked at, but the first mention was uh, from a document from around May 31st of 2002, and it, it states that support class weapons are bulky so the player cannot sprint while they are carrying one. Quick note here, at this stage in development in 2002, there was still an idea for separate weapon classes, and they were divided into infantry, rifle, grenade, charge, and support weapons. The support weapon class included the Spanker rocket launcher and fuel rod cannon, and also cut weapons like the Covenant Shredder and Forerunner gravity rifle. The mention that players could explicitly not sprint with these support weapons is one of the few mentions of sprint in these early design documents. We've seen videos of, of sprint kind of working in like modded beta builds. Do you remember how testing it or how long it lasted in, in, in Halo 2? You know, I, that was part of the core sort of controls player package stuff that uh, Jamie Griesmer was the sandbox design lead was doing. Mm -hmm. And he may have had that in his very, very early goals, um, like first couple of months before I was even officially, you know, designer on the project. Mm -hmm. But it really didn't last very long because we never planned on sprint in any of our designs for multiplayer. We, we never thought that it was right. going to exist. So I think it may have been, you know, musings that, Jamie had early along with something that did get prototyped. I, I remember actually playing with it, which was lean, where you could peek around a corner and mm. lean. That actually got prototyped. I don't actually, it may have, but I never saw it. If, if Sprint got prototyped, I don't think I ever even saw it. Um, and it got decided against very, very quickly, certainly mm -hmm. before I even had started on any of the map designs. Yeah, there's a few A few of the weapons got sprint animations first mm -hmm. person and, and and that was really it i see now i'm curious i'm a, next time i talk to jamie i'm going to ask him um he, he'll, he'll i'm sure he'll remember but yeah it was it was not part of the game uh by the time i came on board gotcha uh, speaking of the early systems that jamie was working on there's also a mention in these documents of a sprinting melee attack which is really interesting to see because it's a piece of the really robust melee combo system that was originally planned with multiple different types of melee attacks for each weapon. And we actually got a sneak peek at that system, and I think the only public look was in the E3 campaign demo when the Brute tries to jack the Warthog towards the end and Cheap jumps off the Hog and hits the Brute with three very quick melees that have different animations. Oops. Which none of us realized at the time were potentially part of a completely different system. Do you remember if that made it into builds at all, think, the, the melee combo system? You know, I, not really, because it was never, nothing, none of that was ever accessible to to multiplayer. I think that was just experiments that they were doing. Um, mm -hmm. Right, And the way it worked is all, all these features had to be, you know, they, they could implement them for a single player on a single console, but then to actually get them working in a multiplayer environment, they had to be made network safe. They had to, you know, so sure. a lot of the experiments that they were doing, if if they never made it out the gate, you know, on the campaign side and the core systems, no one ever took the time to actually network them and, you know, give them to us to play with, so to speak. So I, I, I feel like I was just along for the ride as they were experimenting a little bit with some of that stuff, but mm -hmm. never, never seriously considered any of it for multiplayer for whatever it's worth. Yeah. I don't know why, but... I, I do think the decisions about some of those sprint and melee combos and some of those other things, I feel like those decisions to not go that path were made pretty early in development. Mm -hmm. 
which was to my benefit, right? Because I had enough to deal with already. Certainly, yeah. I think um, things like the the melee combo system, they're so robust and detailed. It's amazing to see them laid out in these documents in one day. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to get a hold of Jamie to to get the rundown on exactly (laughs) the design process uh yep. just because there's every melee attack varied from weapon to weapon yep. and the different types of flurries and swings you could do it's a, it's amazing to see kind of those early those early ideas well, and you know we're, we're all working together and we're all part of the same team we're all sitting in a big open room together so you'd think that there'd be a lot more sort of interaction but i was so heads down mm-hmm. with everything i had on my plate with online and and all of that that i just i mean the you know, my interaction with jamie was giving him feedback on the weapons primarily um, because mm-hmm. we were the main test bed for the weapons. Right. right. So it's just, here's what's working. Here's what isn't. Here's the gaps. We, we need a weapon that does this. We need that. And, oh, and, and of course, the big innovation that did make it in there um, with with weapons is dual wielding. So sure. we were the test bed for dual wielding. And lots and lots and lots of feedback on that. That was a, that was a challenging one to figure out. Yeah, I bet. And the exact balancing for, for yep. sure. Very, very challenging. Um, we talked a little bit about power-ups in the last episode uh, and kind of your desire to broaden the power-up base. And I had to dig to find a few more uh, because they really aren't mentioned in, in many documents. But there's a reference in early 2003 to a power-up called Haste. And the text reads, there will be a new power-up called Haste. This will increase your movement speed by 250%. When you move at full speed, you will have motion blur. So that kind of speaks to <laughs> what you had mentioned of, of the possibility of a, of a speed boost yep. power yeah, up okay, in yeah. Halo so, 2. Oh, so I was. I, I don't know if it's the same one we were talking you about. You were right. But yeah, that's, I, I remember wanting to have that. I wanted more variability and more more sort of power weapons and their equivalents, right? P- more power-ups and more more really valuable sort of items that you could you know fight over and, and attain a, you know, a temporary badass state, if mm-hmm. you will. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I really didn't get very many of them, sadly. Another cut power up was uh, Infravision. And the, the text for that one in the spec was, when you use this power up, you'll be able to pick out opponents better in dark environments and far away. You will also be able to see invisible players. If an explosion goes off nearby while you're using this power up, you'll be temporarily blinded. So it's, it's kind of another one yeah. that, that explores that. And in theory, that would have been awesome. I think in reality, we didn't we didn't really have the dynamic lighting outside of one hallway on Zanzibar. We didn't really have the dynamic lighting in the environment to make something like that practical. Mm-hmm. Um, so we, we would need a different, you know, more robust lighting model to actually make that be useful. Mm-hmm. So next up is something that is referenced in quite a few design documents and map plans. And of course, many fans will have seen and remember the pre-release screenshots or the edge magazine exclusive, but that is the ATV. Yeah. Which, of course, was planned for Halo 2. Yep. And there's only one mention of the ATV in these specific documents, but it's an interesting one. And it, and it states that the ATV was renamed to Mongoose, and the last edit date on that Word document is January of 2003, which kind of means that the Mongoose was actually named much earlier than, than most Halo fans <laughs> might have expected, even yeah. though it ultimately didn't ship in Halo 2. Yeah, you know, I, I really wanted it. Um, like I was saying, with you know, with the the core sandbox team, mm-hmm. we really were lobbying for things we wanted for multiplayer, but we we had no support. Right, that if it didn't fit their vision for the campaign, we didn't really get it. That was yeah. kind of the way it went. But that didn't stop us from you know making our our voices known of what we would like. Mm-hmm. And and the one vehicle that I really I don't remember why anymore, but the one vehicle that I really really wanted for multiplayer was at the time the ATV. And at some point, we, we came close to getting it in there. And that, well, there was a, um, a vehicle modeler, a guy named Eric Arroyo. Mm-hmm. And Eric actually modeled the ATV. So, like, oh, we came so close. But then just, there just wasn't, you know, the team didn't have time to implement, you know, the controls and physics yeah. and destruction mm-hmm. or whatever, whatever else, whatever other work. I don't remember what it was. But sure, uh, yeah. we came so close. So then when we were working on Halo 3, of course, that was right out the gate. That was one that I just insisted on very very vocally mm-hmm. it's like all right we didn't get it last time but damn it we're gonna get it this time yeah. and i remember when we got it in there uh when we got it in and we played a big game we you know on um on uh, uh you're talking about valhalla valhalla thank you thank you that's yeah. it yeah we actually first got the got it in in halo 3 on valhalla and i remember when we did because it was just it was a hilarious moment because the way we implemented it is we we set it up so that it had two seats mm-hmm. and you could you know you could ride with uh, two Master Chiefs, one with his arm around the other one. Um, <laughs> so it was fun. But everyone had a great time. It was a lot of fun. And then I was like, damn it. I so wish we'd gotten this in Halo 2. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that same Edge magazine article, the one that released way before Halo 2's launch, also showcased the Jungle Hog, 
the snow hog with treads, and the troop transport hog. But there were also a few in your documents that I don't think have ever been mentioned or seen. Yeah. And those were the desert camo hog and the night mission camo hog. Those, all those variants on the hog, that, that's one of the things, those docs, that didn't come from me. One of the, I would say a few things probably, because uh, I think those ideas came from Marcus, who was the art director. Mm-hmm. Um, and he really wanted to do all those variants on the hog. And, of course, I was like, Sh- yeah, shit, I'll take it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, but then they never happened. But, yeah, it's funny. He's online right now. I've seen him just his little hobby project is yes. re- remaking his hog, right? The, mm-hmm. He's a big fan. It's his baby. He's a big fan. And he really wanted those variants. Just in case some of you listening aren't familiar with what Max and I are talking about here, make sure to check out Marcus Leto's Twitter at game underscore fabricator, where you can see Marcus revisiting some of his original Halo work and rebuilding his original Warthog, Mark V armor, and the MA5B assault rifle. The images are absolutely stunning. So once again, that's game underscore fabricator on Twitter. Another thing, there's one single mention in all the documents I have of a flashbang grenade, but uh, there's also a mention in change notes from October 2002 that states that we are adding the ability to blind enemies that are looking at high explosive grenades and stun enemies that are just outside of the damage range to make it more useful for more than just damage. Do you remember anything about either flashbangs or um, additional attributes for for the frag grenade at the concept stage? On that one, I'm guessing that that might have been something that they were experimenting with for the campaign, mm-hmm. you know, in the audio and they get, you know, the, the ring right. in your ears and some of that stuff, the cool effects. And I think they might have been thinking about that for the campaign. So naturally, anything that I'll get, I'll try and see, see if there's a place for it. Mm-hmm. So I think that might have been that, but I guess they must have not ended up doing it for campaign. Um, so naturally, we didn't get for multiplayer. There are so many early weapons that are detailed out, which is amazing to see. I think to get the the real rundown, we'd once again need to, to hear the lowdown from Jamie Griesemer, but there were so many things, the Blamite Harpoon, yeah. <laughs> the Covenant Sniper Rifle, the Sniper Rod, the Disintegrator, the Shredder, a Gravity Rifle, Jackal Shields, which we have seen yeah. in kind of modded beta builds. Are there any weapons that you remember, whether it's uh, the non-lethal EMP mines, satchel charges, anything that jumps out that did make it uh, into the build that didn't ship, or, or were they all pretty early? I don't I don't think there were i'm trying to remember I, I was always pushing for more weapons i always wanted more variety um, and i was always pushing for more weapons but i don't i don't remember any making it there may have been but i just can't recall any actually making it into multiplayer and then not shipping mm-hmm. i mean I, I really wanted all the way back from halo one the the harpoon gun or whatever it's called that you see in the very first ever yeah uh halo build where you, i think the video released you shoot it into a tire mm-hmm. um that sort of thing like yeah that was really cool um we were just desperate for getting anything that we could. In, in the campaign, they ended up creating a weapon pretty late in the game that was the Sentinel Beam. Yeah. Right? You destroy the Sentinel, and then you could pick up its its beam weapon. I, I remember that came really... That was probably the last weapon that came in the campaign. And so I ended up adding that to the uh, multiplayer palette at the very, very end and just tossing it in there. But that's one of the reasons it's not uh, it's our standard weapon mm-hmm. in multiplayer. We didn't have any time to tune it and tweak it and figure out how it how it fits. So it's just like, why not give it to people as an option? Sure. <laughs> Go to town. Yeah. There's also a gold mine of vehicles. I have a feeling it's going to be a similar answer, but yep. it's worth reading out <laughs> just a few of the names. Um, yes. Yeah, jog my memory here. So the modding community has found a few, like we talked about, like the, the Falcon and the drivable shadow, but yep. there was additional ones that I don't know if anyone's ever heard about. There was one that was the Orca, which is a troop carrying watercraft. I'll, I'll read a few of them. Okay. Then there was a mortar orca equipped, of course, with mortar launchers um, to hit enemy fortifications along the shore. There was the anti-aircraft scorpion, yeah. the covenant fuel truck. Uh, there was the first mention of the brute cycle, uh, desire to have a brute instead ride an animal, <laughs> excavation ghosts and shadows, and uh, the first mention of a VTOL and special forces ghosts. So it's interesting, again, to see just how robust and ambitious yeah. those original lists were. Unfortunately, I think that, again, kind of like the weapons, I think a lot of that was paper design and the stuff mm-hmm. just never never got built in the campaign. We just we had, we had no support to be able to do custom anything weapon-wise or vehicle-wise or anything like that in multiplayer. Outside of, I mean, the only customization I did is I, get, I, I added the horn to the hog. So mm-hmm. very limited customization. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, because I would have gone to town with that stuff. It would have been a lot of fun. Certainly. It's amazing, too, how just how far a lot of the designs were. If you, like, Jamie had kind of already mapped out all of the different damage zones for yeah. just about all of those <laughs> vehicles and down yeah. to the crazy level of detail of how those yeah. how those vehicles kind of behaved. Yeah, and, I, and some of that, 
it's possible some of that was leftover designs, you know, or desires from Halo One because I know they they had a lot that you know on the cutting room floor, so to speak. Sure, sure, of course. Now, this next feature is something that you and I actually showed off at a panel back in 2019. And I remember when I finally found a way to open it because my PC couldn't for a while. I had to find the right software. But once I finally cracked the file open, my mind was blown. And that prototype video was for a feature called the overhead map. (laughs) I knew. I knew that's where you were going. (laughs) Yeah, that that was was a total pet feature of mine. I, I was always a big proponent of accessibility. And I was always aware that one of the things that one of the things that gives players an advantage is knowledge of the maps naturally, but that could also be one of the things that led a new player to have a bad experience, right? Mm-hmm. It's just not knowing their way around the map. So you know, what better way to help you navigate than give you some form of navigational aid? So we're thinking about that and said, okay, how do you do that in a 3D environment? And how do you do that in the, naturally, let's look at lockout, the most complicated you know, interlinking mess of a 3D environment from a navigational mm-hmm. standpoint. And if we can solve it for lockout, we can solve it for anything. The notion was that you would, when you hit that button, it, would, it wasn't just like a little pop-up in the corner. And when you hit that button, the camera would pull out from your current location to the overhead map. And that would give you this context for where you were mm-hmm. and sort of convey where you were rather than just be like a toggle to an overhead map. Um, yeah. And so we were kind of experimenting with that. And then Uh, Most of that was Dave Canlin trying to figure out how do you represent this 3D space and schematic form and things like that. So I I think it was a cool idea. I would have liked to have done it. I think it would have been probably a net positive sort of benefit if we had. Um, Mm -hmm. But it was just never, it was too big a feature, too complex a feature for our very, very limited implementation bandwidth. Certainly, yeah. When you look at how robust it was, both in the prototype and in the spec, mm-hmm. it's easy to understand. First of all, it's easy to fall in love with the feature, but <laughs> second of all, it's easy to understand why something like that would be cut. Well, here's the real question. Has anyone, has any FPS ever done an overhead map like we were prototyping there? I'm really glad you asked because I think a lot of games have, and, and many years later, taken features that that overhead map was trying to do. But short answer to your question, I don't think anyone has has done exactly not, what not we're quite like. Yeah, I can't think of anything yeah. that's quite like what we were planning. But maybe maybe there's something out there. If there is, let me know because I'd love to play with it and see whether yeah. the idea was actually any good. <laughs> I think what's so cool too is you were already bringing in things like map location uh, names. So when you pull out of that lockout camera, you get to see a name for the lift tower thing like that, yep. um, which of course uh, wouldn't really come online until Reach with the, the location names in the bottom left yeah. in text. And, and that, that's exactly what that was. That, I was like, okay, well, if we're going to do this overhead map, it's an awesome opportunity, which I, did, I just didn't have otherwise mm-hmm. to give people, to, to create a common lingo, common language around these um, to help facilitate communication. Again, yeah. everything was about this, you know, overcoming the, these sort of inherent hurdles of being mm-hmm. distant. But in hindsight, I also think, why didn't I just do the simple version that we did later? Mm-hmm, I, mm-hmm. Why did I never think of doing the simple version? Um, obviously, later on, sure. uh, someone at Bungie did, but I never did. And as we look at what games would, would go on to do later, it's so interesting that there's so many inclusions in this concept of many ideas and concept that would come to the world of online multiplayer many years later. Uh, some of them are ability to place nav points in binocular mode or, or using the D-pad. So if you think about what Battlefield has done oh, yeah. in that area with yep. essentially ability to mark targets, uh, waypoints for others. The genesis of those ideas, a lot of them for me at least came from the Myth the Fallen Lords days. Yeah. Where, mm-hmm. where Myth had a, uh, a true like top, top down overhead map in the corner, right? Like you would yeah. expect. But it had this awesome feature in multiplayer where you could actually mark it up and draw on it. And everyone in your network game. Yeah, you did mention that. Yeah, would see. And it was cool, right? It's like, okay, guys, here's a strategy. It's kind of like the football coach, right? Here's yeah. the play. And it was amazing. So a lot of that was like just me remembering how useful that was for coordination, mm-hmm. right? And, and trying to figure out what's our what's our analog for that? What's our version of that? Um, so yeah, cool ideas. I, I doubt I was the first person to have them. And uh it's cool that some of them finally came to the world of games. Yeah, and even the ability to broadcast preset phrases, yep. such as I need ammo, enemy sighted, things like that, um, which has come to different games in different ways too. Well, and at the time we were dealing with real limitations where very few people had uh, headsets. We didn't know when we were designing Halo 2 what 
like VoiceCom, how, how prevalent it would be, right? We're, yeah. Um, and whether people would like it and whether you, people would speak the same language and everything else. I guess common problems today, but we, we, we were forging into the unknown and trying to figure out, okay, well, that doesn't mean there aren't things that we can do to make it a better experience. Mm-hmm. Now, something we didn't get to talk about, Max, that's so closely related uh, during the social features episode was Halo 2's proximity voice system, which was one of my favorite aspects of Halo 2 multiplayer that kind of blew my mind that you could sit outside of a base and hear the and spy on conversations <laughs> of, of an enemy team. Yeah, yeah. that that uh, proxi- I, I remember not only implementing it, but prior to that, I remember agonizing over what the right implementation was and querying a lot of people at, at Bungie for their opinion. And it, it being one of those things kind of like kind of like matchmaking and server lists and whatnot that it was incredibly polarizing and opinions were all over the map. And, and in a, on a map like Zanzibar, that like came to its full oh, potential, yeah. right? And for, I remember that where you could, as the attacker, you could sneak up very, very carefully um, onto the base. And if you were you know, paying attention, you could actually hear guys inside talking about their defense, which was amazing. Yeah, I remember on both <laughs> Zanzibar and Burial Mounts actually being outside the base and thinking, I've never felt this in a game. <laughs> it only came to Halo 2 and it did not come back to the franchise. And I can't off the top of my head, think of another game that I've spent time playing that also does it. I can't figure out why it was kind of a Halo 2 one-hit wonder. Do you have any ideas? What, the the proximity chat? Like why, you mean like why nobody else did it that way? Oh, it didn't come back to Halo 3. It didn't come back to the franchise. I, you know, I don't, I, I was in charge of Halo 3 up till the final nine months when I you know left Bungie, but I, I don't remember planning to change it. Um, mm-hmm. So when I left, I think, think i had planned to keep it intact so now now i'm curious why why they might have changed it i'm not sure i'd have to go look um but no i don't know i know that the way the xbox live team implemented parties globally Mm -hmm. created just a mess of problems for us on halo 3 right sure because all of a sudden you had your party which in in halo 2 where, where we invented parties your party was always in your game with you right and not only that but in a match made game your party was also always on your team with you Mm -hmm. so now all of a sudden with halo 3 where parties were this sort of agnostic we couldn't control them agnostic of the system all of a sudden we had to deal with situations where you had party members who may not be in the same team they might not even be in the same game and you could be having chat with them in parallel so we we kind of lost control of it we couldn't you know we we couldn't control the party chat anymore and just and now you had this whole party chat channel that existed independent of the game in parallel to the game and it was just chaos. And it, in my mind, it really ruined a lot of the magic that we had in Halo 2. So that might have been a factor. Sure. Now, given that they've been covered in detail in other Halo 2 development coverage, I don't want to spend too much time on them. But it's also pretty incredible and related to what we were just talking about to note that both Observers and Saved Films were specked out pretty detailed and planned for Halo 2 as well. Yeah, I really wanted the Observer mode especially. I was. It's interesting. I don't remember why. I wasn't actually as attached to Saved Films. Mm-hmm. Right. So Save Films was kind of a legacy feature in a way in that um, the Marathon Games, I think, back in the day had Save Films. So it was just a like, yeah, of course, why not have Save Films? We had back in the Marathon days. Mm-hmm. So that, that was a kind of a no-brainer. Now, details are much more complicated. But the thing that I thought was really more of a game changer was Observer Mode. And, and I remember thinking long and hard about how do you, what's the interface just to get into Observer Mode? Because doing the the user interface design for the pregame lobby was just a monumental undertaking in and of itself, yeah. right? With sixteen networked players and up to what eight teams and the hosts selecting all the settings and how do you broadcast those on a very very limited screen space and party leaders being communicated, all these things, right? There are all these firsts we were doing, yeah. and then add to that list, how do you also allow players to join an observer mode, observer team? And I, I remember finally figuring out how to do it. And I was so happy because just toggling into observer mode was such a challenge. And and I felt like I finally ended at a very elegant solution. And we just, we just ran out of time. We just didn't have any time to do it, but it would have been amazing and simple and straightforward and way ahead of its time. And a huge, a big, I would say a big game changer, but clearly, you know, Halo 2 multiplayer was very successful without it. So maybe not a game changer, but uh, it certainly would have, uh, it would have ushered in esports and and whatnot even more, I think, than uh, Halo did. Absolutely, yeah. It's 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 wild to think about what Halo Two accomplished 
even without the feature, but like you say, how it even could have plussed up the entire experience. And, and, and actually, one of the reasons I wanted it wasn't just, you, you know, me, it's not just for the competitive player. I also wanted it for the novice player because there, there's something about being able to be an observer in a match that just seemed like a great sort of easy introduction that you otherwise don't get when people are shooting at you and sure. trying to blow you up, right? Um, so I, I wanted it also for accessibility reasons. Yeah, it's just like really, uh, really, you could take, say, any video game or even any board game. I think a lot of people are like, hey, let me watch a bit. Exactly. Let me see a bit of this before I jump in. <laughs> yep, exactly. Save films, they actually serve some of the same purposes, right? You, you can watch a save game and get a sense for the map mm-hmm. and it's a safe environment and all of that. But it's not, it just, yeah, for, for some reason, I just wasn't as into it as I was the uh, observer mode, not as interactive. Am I correct in thinking that the, some of the work for observer mode might have still been utilized in what became the follow camera, which essentially was the the view of a player, you know, the view that a player gets in Halo 2, either when you're waiting to respawn or if you're you're out of lives. Yeah, your death cam. In reading the spec, it, it kind of looks like that a lot of the work was able to still go into like, oh, yeah. what became the follow camera. Yeah, it was, I mean, it was always really simple. Observer mode, as I spec'd it out, knowing, knowing that it, we were incredibly resource constrained on the engineering side, especially, um, the way I spec'd it out was incredibly simple, right? The hard mm-hmm. part was just figuring out the UI for it. Otherwise, you were just jumping around to a teammate camera and you could just bounce between different teammates in a following cam. It, it really was nothing more sophisticated than that, if I recall, or v- not much. You have the design doc, so you know. It wasn't much more sophisticated than that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's there's two little cool tidbits that I remember uh, from from the Observer design doc. One was that... Uh, observers had their own voice channel, so multiple observers could actually talk to each other during yep. the game. Because which you is, can't have them cheating by talking right. to players there in the game. So naturally, yep, put them in their own voice channel. <laughs> yeah, and the last one, which is way too cool, is the idea that in the post-game stats, observers had a category for how many kills they observed. So there was even a, <laughs> a measure of how effective an observer they, they were. Yeah, I mean, you know, just trying to try. It's like low-hanging fruit, right? Just yeah. that's the obvious, easy low-hanging fruit that we can do and make it fun. That's pretty cool. That would have been fun. Yeah, absolutely. One thing on save films that I think is worth mentioning, which is cool, is not only do you have the appearance of, um, you know, X to save film in the early post-game Carnage Report mock-ups and things like that, but also the idea that you can also trade films. My guess is that there there might have been a realization at some point, too, that like to really make the idea of trading films and this content flourish, that, that something like what would become Halo 3's file share system kind of was needed to make the whole thing work yeah you know the, the whole save films was more we had that we had this notion that yeah save films would be cool we've done we've done it in past games save films would be cool and we kind of mocked it up in the interface mm-hmm. but it never it actually never went beyond that i think i think from a share film standpoint we knew that there's just no way it was ever going to happen in game right we didn't we didn't have the bandwidth to do it in game but we did have this notion that oh we can just do that on the website right mm-hmm. we can just do sharing on the website so you can Save films, you can mark, you know, I want to save this film, hit a button. The in-game implementation is really minimal, um, really lightweight, which is what we needed if anything had any chance of Mm -hmm. making it beyond, you know, beyond the big bets like parties and friends lists and stuff we were making. So here's a minimal implementation, and then we can do all the hard work on the uh, the BungieNet side. Um, Mm -hmm. But of course, that even the minimal implementation was too much. Another feature that sits kind of along that set is um, tournaments, and there were some pretty big plans for for tournaments, but as discussed in episode two, uh, the feature set needed to do tournaments correctly, even to this day, is is a demanding one. Yeah, well, and, and tournaments were different because with save films, we just we put in, we sort of stubbed it in, right? With here's how, where you would save a film, but there's really not much more to it, and we we never did the planning work for save films, right? It, it was really just sort of acknowledging here's where they fit in the UI, and yes, we want save films. Tournaments though were different because I did actually plan out all. I say everything with tournaments. I'm sure there was a mountain of things I hadn't foreseen, but I put a huge amount of work into planning out this automated multi-level tournament system. So very, very different than Save Films and that it came a hell of a lot closer to becoming a reality. And, and as we talked about, the Xbox Live team actually implemented a lot of the API in the back end mm-hmm. before they eventually cut bait on it because we cut bait on it because we couldn't do the end game side of it. Yeah, it was really robust. More robust than even, I would say, uh, especially on a console, feature sets that exist. I mean, you had brackets. I think they could host 65,000 yep. player tournaments. And like you said, also, the matches all didn't have to happen simultaneously. It was pretty incredible, the level to which you had you had kind of spec'd it out. 
it is interesting. It's one of those things that was sort of sheer invention, kind of like parties and some other things. It really was blazing new trails. Unlike parties, it didn't get implemented. So to this day, I don't actually know whether it was a good idea and whether it would have worked mm -hmm. um, because it was so it was so novel. Sure. Yeah. Do you know how late in the game tournaments made it when they ultimately had the, the plug had to be pulled? Um, it was definitely in the last year that, you know, kind of slow realization about what, what's going to make it and what, what wouldn't. I, I remember giving the Xbox Live team a sort of early warning because I knew they were doing a lot of work on the tournament API. And I remember in the sort of final year giving them a warning that we're probably going to make some cuts. And the first thing that we're going to cut if we do will be tournaments. Mm -hmm. um, sadly, I didn't want to do that, but just I felt like that was the respectful thing to do to give them as much advance notice as I could. Mm -hmm. Something uh, dedicated Halo fans will have heard very lightly referenced uh, in the Halo 2 prototype tech demo we referenced in episode number two was the idea of the grunt voice filter um, and different voice masking filters. So we're going to go ahead and quickly play it again. Listen up. The guys from Blizzard just moved in downstairs. They threw down the gauntlet. We all set to give them a little ass whooping soccer blood gulch. Hey, dudes! You have room for one more grunty grunt? Jeez, guys, who's the guy with the grunt filter? Let's boot him. Hey, no, wait! So we promised we'd circle back to this uh, during episode two. <laughs> and in addition to the standard Xbox Live voice mask that did ship, there were originally plans for the grunt voice mask, as you heard there. Yeah. And then even more exciting is the fact that there were originally also plans for a Cortana voice filter, a profit filter, and a chief filter as well, which would have been pretty great. Yeah, I remember that because I remember, I think the idea with the voice masks actually started with the Xbox Live team and privacy concerns and all that. Mm -hmm. And I think our, our take on it was, okay, you know, we get it, but why take you out of the fiction, right? So right. that's kind of cool. What if we, you know, we have these cool characters. What if we sort of fictionalize it in our world and, and give you this optional different voice masks? And then it kind of keeps you in the fiction of the game a bit more. Um but it never, it never went beyond paper design. Mm -hmm. I think one additional tidbit that I was able to put together only after I had seen the design documents and that fans might remember is when Joe Staten is talking about taking on the Blizzard guys and he mentions soccer on Blood Gulch. Mm -hmm. And now from reading multiplayer mode documents, I was able to learn that soccer was the original internal nickname for uh, Neutral Bomb Assault, which kind of puts together this like 15-year puzzle in my head of what <laughs> soccer was. Neutral Bomb Assault is such a lame name, but I think so is soccer. So clearly I felt that soccer was not sufficient and failed to come up with something much better. <laughs> yeah, it harkens back to your original note about got to be a better name than Assault. Yeah, yeah. See, there you go. Exactly. <laughs> it's stuck now, though. Yeah. <laughs> 15 years later, it's yep. in there. Well, and not just that. There are other other names I came up with that I still hear today and they make me laugh like Things like Big Team Battle and BTB and all that. It's like, mm -hmm. it's, it's such a stupid name. I mean, it's very descriptive, but just such a lame name that I came up with. I, whatever, it's descriptive. And things, God, there's others too, like uh, Fiesta. Mm -hmm. That was another ridiculous name for a game mode I came up with, or setting. I remember, I guess, yeah, the game mode that used yeah. the random weapon setting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, silly. And, it, and whenever I hear it today and I think back to when I came up with that name. And I remember at the time thinking, that's a stupid name. And then today <laughs> I still hear it like so many yep. years later and I'm like, Oh God, I wish I'd come up with a better name. <laughs> it's true. You didn't, you did at the time you didn't realize the scale yeah, yeah. of the Halo 2 player base and, <laughs> the and longevity what, these terrible names would have. <laughs> I would have tried harder. <laughs> uh, speaking of, there's some good ones from playtest notes of uh, some r ridiculous sounding things while we're on the topic. And I promised you we would get back to these and it's sure. a spreadsheet titled in-game messages, uh, which would have been the lines that you would have brought yourself to the Jeff Stites review sessions yeah. to record the multiplayer announcer lines. And right. there's some medals and in-game events that I don't think have ever been discovered or discussed. I don't think they made it into game code, which is why they kind of only live in these documents. So the first is a set of bomb multi-kill events. And we're going to have to see if we can get Jeff Steitzer to, to give us these after all these years. Sure. But some of the bomb multi-kill events are pretty fantastic. So instead of double kill, triple kill, uh, etc., players who are getting multi-kills meleeing with the bomb would have heard bomb-tastic, bomb uh, knuckle sandwich, body blow, own zord, and sucker punched, yeah. um, which all would have been pretty good <laughs> Steitzer VO. We, you, yeah, I remember we recorded all those. And I, I remember going in there, I didn't have any experience with the uh, you know, doing the audio recording and 
at some point I got very short, very little notice that, hey, Steitzer's coming in and we, we'd like to just get knock out all these audio because he's going to be busy with other stuff later and we'd like to just get it done. So, hey, you've got like, I don't know, two days or something to mm-hmm. figure out all the all the multiplayer announcer audio that you ever might need on this game. Yeah. I was like, oh, shit, okay. <laughs> so I just, you know, so I just sat down at that spreadsheet and just started filling it with ideas of, you know, things I wanted, things I might get, things I might want to use right. just as much as I could, just all the variety I could think of. And just on the off chance that we might get this feature or we might get this ability to permute you know, these things or whatever without actually knowing whether I was going to get any of that. So that, that's what that represents. But yeah, we actually did record all those lines in that spreadsheet, plus some that he improvised also a little bit. Mm-hmm. So there's also more in that re- oh, audio session. It's true. There's <laughs> even more we don't know about. Yeah. There's a few other good ones that never shipped, but I'm sure were recorded from that same session. Um, for vehicle-related medals, there were kamikaze, uh, look both ways, and in the noggin. <laughs> and then a few extras. One is blowout maybe after a steak dinner or something on a a 30 kill uh, (laughs) win or a 20 kill win rather. Another is try harder then turn down the suck, which funny enough ended up being a Marine quote that was used in campaign. Yep. And probably my favorite uh, that I, that I got to find is uh, just holy shit, which (laughs) would be, you know, what's funny about hearing you say all those is I actually have a really vivid recollection of sitting in the booth with Marty mm-hmm. while Steitzer actually did every one of those. So on, on most of those, I actually ha- can remember exactly, or not exactly, I couldn't repeat it, but I remember him mm-hmm. doing his variation on turn down the suck and all that. <laughs> and uh, so we got to find those audio recordings because he's do. amazing. I was, I was blown away. He's so incredibly talented. And then when Marty would be like, well, let's do it again and let's do it a little this way and that way and mm-hmm. do permutations on turn down the suck. It's just, sure. a, just a fun, fun experience. So after Max and I recorded this, I am excited to say that I was able to get a pretty good surprise for this episode. Hey, Max and Andy, this is Jeff Steitzer. That's right, I can't believe it, but Jeff Steitzer was kind enough to send over a few of the unreleased Halo 2 multiplayer lines and re-record them for us for this show. Uh, Here are the bomb multi-kill medals that we referenced earlier. You might recall that the first one was Bomb-tastic. Bomb-tastic! And even better yet, for the double kill, Bombalicious. Bombalicious! And Jeff even sent over a few versions of each, so here's a slightly heavier and thicker version I've also taken a liking to. Bombalicious. And lastly, perhaps the best of the bomb multi-kill medals, and maybe one of the best medals to never officially make it into a Halo game, Knuckle Sandwich. Knuckle Sandwich. God, that's good. Before we move on, I want to give a quick shout out to Jeff Steitzer for sending over some audio. Uh, You are a legend, and we're so lucky to have you as such an important part of the Halo franchise. Thanks, Jeff. Before we start to wrap up, I think we've got time for just a few more hidden gems from Max's design documents. Okay, Max, there's a few cool things on early versions of the post-game Carnage reports. Uh, Two things that were originally specked out maybe to be included in the PGCR. One is kill steals, which is originally included as a stat line, but that could have uh, greatly exacerbated some post-game Xbox Live arguments <laughs> and another one did we not did we not implement kill steals oh, no no of course you can see assists and things like that which ah. people which a lot of people ended up you know saying were, were yeah, kills yeah. that had been <laughs> stolen but never ah, that's a bummer I, I i don't know why we didn't implement it we should have yeah there's, there's another one um that was at one point in the plans which was days at level which would have displayed how many <laughs> days you had essentially the been Marco stuck shame. Yeah. <laughs> yes how many days you would have been stuck at your <laughs> multiplayer ranking which also probably would have done more harm than good but i still think it would have been fun well and I, I learned that lesson on halo 3 when i was like okay when you get stuck we still need to give you a hill to climb so to speak or a progression right so we ended up having this experience based and, and i think that ended up being a bit of a mark of shame Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, really glad we didn't do that in Halo 2. Yeah. 
a cool um, note on just how robust the original plans for teleporters uh, were, which we talked a little bit about in the previous episode. But a, a document from late 2002, early 2003 states, uh, Halo 2 split screen multiplayer will support teleporters very similar to Halo's teleporters, but there will be two key changes. First, players will be able to fire weapons and throw grenades and net game objects through teleporters. Teleporters that link one to another will use the same shape and color, helping kind of educate players on where each teleporter goes. Do you remember if anything like this got concept further or if it, if it stayed on paper? Yeah, was, unfortunately, it's just on paper because I really wanted that. I, I thought those would be good sort of usability aids. Mm-hmm. Um and, and also just good fun being able to <laughs> be able to toss grenades through teleporters and whatnot. So I really wanted them, but yeah, they just never got implemented. We got the basic because because teleporters were not one of the campaign features. So that's one of the few features that really was multiplayer specific. That's true. So, but what we got again, we were so starved for engineering support. What we got was just the bare minimum, and then we lived with it. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty interesting you bring that up and you bring up that distinction because even after working on Halo myself for so many years, there's there's not a lot of other items that are in that bucket, right? That are in either the sandbox yep. or environment objects or things like that that are multiplayer exclusive. Oh, at least in Halo 2, exceptionally few. Yeah. Um, almost nothing, along with like rocket ammo and a few other things. Yeah. There's almost yeah. nothing. Absolutely. Max, after talking about all of these today and and letting me um, very graciously, I thank you uh, very much, jog your memory um, (laughs) through through these these old documents. I thought I I had a good memory, Andy, but some of this stuff, I I mean, you've definitely jogged my memory, but uh, I expect there's more now. Now I want to go look at these old design docs again because there's some fun stuff in there that I hadn't thought about in 15 years. Yeah, there's even more things that I can't wait to even spend a little bit more time uh, looking over. Uh, After talking about all of these, are there any other um, features that that come to mind or or things you feel like we didn't get to talk about? Hmm, That's a that's a good question there. I I feel like all my all my ideas were put on paper. So you seems like you would have probably gotten a (laughs) sort of a peek behind the curtain, so to speak. I was definitely good at uh, putting everything down on paper. I don't know why that was, but uh, well, I'm, I'm thankful. Well, well, for our purposes here. I was right? going to say, I'm thankful for it, and I'm sure our <laughs> yeah. listeners are, are thankful for it. As we close out this episode and series, uh, this year, of course, Max, is the 20th anniversary of the franchise. Uh, after all this time, is there a favorite memory that sticks out uh, from working on these games? Wow, that's that's a big question. I'm trying to, a favorite memory from working on Halo multiplayer, you know, UI and multiplayer is all that I you know worked on back in the day. Mm-hmm. Um you know, when, when I think back, there, there's a couple of moments I feel like I've brought up a few of them on, you know, as we've been talking across all these episodes. There's definitely these these sort of highlight moments that, that really jump out and, and I think incredibly fondly of. I, I've probably mentioned most of them, but, you know, for, for instance, the very first time that we got uh, Lockout playable, you know, was an awesome, awesome memory. And, you know, the, the time when we got Zanzibar playable. The, those memories are kind of like gameplay moments in a way, whether I was playing or whether I was, I was observing. Most of the the really strong memories or favorite memories are are times where the internal team primarily got their hands on the work that we were doing for the first time. Just the excitement and the joy. There's some videos out there somewhere showing some of those play tests, but ju- just sort of the thrill of people, you know, boarding the hog and, you know, tossing out the driver and taking it over and driving the flag home. The, the, you know, those moments that I think emerged for many, many people online and playing the game. Mm-hmm. A lot of those moments, we had them first in our internal play tests. And I'd say more often than not, I was an observer to it because I preferred to observe rather than play. I found it more useful for feed. But you also had to play to get the first person's perspective. But it's really useful to watch the group and see their reactions. So there's just so many fond memories of those those first that we had internally that went on to be first time experiences for you and others online also that I, I would guess are also really memorable that the, you know, the first time that you blew up, you know, a hog loaded up carrying the flag back about to score with mm-hmm. a rocket or something is just such a, such a strong memory, right? When you're the hero and save the day. And for me, whether it was me doing it or watching someone else doing it internally and, and just watching the level of excitement and jumping up and down screaming in a land party type context was so much fun. So I, most of the best memories are are those first in the work that I was doing, if that makes sense. Oh, it absolutely does. And I think 
for me, I can think back to my first days and weeks playing Halo 2 and Xbox Live. And I think we all have those moments, whether they were One Flag, CTF, Zanzibar moments or whatever um, they might have been. I think listeners as well, they kind of share that too, where you had these, uh, yeah, like you said, the gameplay moments, the montage moments that stick yep. in your, you know, you can replay them almost just as clear as the day that they took place. And I think that's, it's pretty powerful and it speaks to just how new, fresh and innovative the gameplay was. Well, yeah, and, and for me, when I think about those moments, those, those were motivation and inspiration, right? Because we had this amazing moment in an internal play test. I, I would then take that input, really, that data, and go back and think, holy shit, how, how do I ha- make that happen more often? Right? Yeah. What, what can I do? What can I change to facilitate making that happen for more people or making that happen more often? And, and really, you know, that, that input ends up feeding the game design, the weapon layout, the map design, Etc. And and it's balanced by just as many or probably significantly more crappy moments too, where everyone's yelling and throwing their controllers at the ground and mm-hmm. frustrated. And, and the same way, you look at those moments, you're like, okay, how do we prevent that from happening? How do we add a new path? How do we limit the ammunition on this weapon? But the guy who was on the sniper spree also had fun, so we can't totally nerf it. And you know that that the play balance aspect of making multiplayer is so much fun. And when you get to develop in a and play test daily in a land party setting, ten times more fun. Mm-hmm. Certainly, I, I really can't thank you enough, Max. For first of all, to you and the entire uh, Bungie team for the contributions to not just the world of online multiplayer, but uh, you know the amount of amazing experiences and lifelong friendships and so much more that has emerged from these games. And then also for you letting me deep dive into these design documents. Um, and it's it's been such a pleasure. And I feel like even after these episodes, there's still more to discuss <laughs> the next time we see each other. Yeah. yeah, well, thanks for, you know, thanks for taking the time. And I know that Halo multiplayer has had a huge impact on you. And uh, I appreciate that you're, I appreciate that you're such a fan that you know you're willing to dive through all those old mm-hmm. design documents, and you're willing to take the time and uh, share share some of the experience with uh, other people. Because you know, for me, it, obviously, a lot of a lot of the, this work is really um, significant for so many people mm-hmm. that uh, it feels strange to not talk about it and talk about how it all came about. So I, I really appreciate the forum. Oh, you bet! I've I've had a blast, and I hope you've enjoyed it too. Oh yeah, for sure. I can talk about Halo multiplayer all day. <laughs> <laughs> to all our listeners, thank you so much for joining us on this journey. We hope you enjoyed listening and we look forward to seeing you at Halo and gaming community events as they start to resume. If you see us, please stop by and say hello and to stay in touch with us, follow Max on Twitter at Max Hoberman and I'm at Brav, B-R-A-V. This has been Halo 2 Artifacts. Thanks for listening. Thank you. The final episode of Halo 2 Artifacts was written, produced, and edited by me, Andy bravo Dodinsky. Special thanks go out to Max Hoberman and the entire Halo 2 team at Bungie, and I'd also like to thank Jay Goldberg, Dave Lowmiller, Tahir Hasanjekic, and Sidney Goodman. Music is used under license from Epidemic Sound. Halo is a copyright of the Microsoft Corporation, and Halo 2 Artifacts was created under Microsoft's game content usage rules. It is not endorsed by or affiliated with Microsoft. If you enjoyed this show, please consider leaving a rating and a review on your favorite podcast platform. Thanks for listening, and here's to the next 20 years of Halo.